This program features live coverage of an African safari and may include animal kills and carcasses. Viewer discretion is advised. This is why the Nkunguma Pride is such a firm favourite. It's Kinky Tail. He just looks ready for a fight. This is still her territory. Ooh. The Avoca boys are here to stay. Ooh. How insane was that? Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this edition of Safari Lives. It is, of course, the day when we get to catch up with all our characters for the week and know exactly what they've gotten up to. Now, I am Trishala, and I am, of course, very happy to have you on board. As always, you are my guests today, and I will hopefully find lovely Tlalamba, find some lions, find maybe the evokers, who knows, and even check out the hyena den. So things are happening today. Now, we, like I said, we get to catch up with everything that the characters have done for the week. So let's go and have a look at exactly how that's been today. It has been a contrasting week here in Juma with lots of rain having fallen, providing not only respite from the heat, but also replenishing the watering holes. Hukumuri ventured in from the west to stake a claim to the western parts of Juma, while Tingana, answering his challenge, moved ever south, parallel with the newcomer. Tlalamba kept to her usual areas in the heart of Juma, not straying far from where she last saw her mother Tandi. The Unkuhum pride ventured into the southeastern parts of Juma for a one-night bed and breakfast stay, before laying up just south of the boundary. The Avoca trio returned from the north, moving up and down and being very vocal as they searched for the Unkuhuma pride. Up in the Mara Triangle, we were greeted with many new surprises from the Sausage Tree pride, having moved more north into their old pride lands. While David was blessed to spend some more quality time in the southeast with the Shepherd's Tree male. Has been a busy week. I'm glad to have been a part of it and I hope you guys have too. Like you know, hashtag Safari Live if you'd like to communicate with us on Twitter and of course through the YouTube chat stream. Please, questions and comments, we love to hear from you and especially we have all our characters to talk about today. So please go ahead and ask us anything you like. Now, I'm going to drive ahead and we are going to be in the search of Princess Tlalamba today. I've had no updates on the Game Drive radio yet, but it is still a bit early, so I'm waiting for the others to get out and then hopefully we'll have something that we can follow up on. It is a steamy 29 degrees Celsius or 84 degrees Fahrenheit at the moment. Still slightly windy. Hello, Forktail Drongo. Oh, he's still there. He's still there. He's nice and close. Beaky, can you see him? Oh. I think that they actually irritate me as much as they irritate uh, Tlalamba when she's around or the lions when they're around. They're just constantly bombing them. Well, of course, it's not all me and it's not all Juma and South Africa. It is also Kenya and the Maasai Mara. So let's go to Isaac, who would like to say good afternoon to you all. Well, 
Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Mara Triangle. I am on the other side of the Mara, and apologies for the gremlins that have started to fight Isaac, and I'm sure at one point he is going to come out winning. Well, we got some elephants here, and I think it's a mother and maybe two calves of different ages, and we are very close to the Mara River. Look at that small calf there and feeding quite a distance from the mother, which is a bit strange because she's much younger than the other calf. I would have expected this particular one to be much closer to the mother, but she is quite a distance. I'm talking about maybe 20, 30 feet away. You can see how tall the grass is. Puma, very good. You say, wow, those are huge tasks. And let's have a quick look at them again. And Puma will tell you what. This is a female, definitely, because as much as I'm not that close to her, but by her having two calves close to her, it definitely tells you she is a female. And you'd imagine if it was a male Puma, it could, they could even be much bigger. See how they're growing like a little crooked facing each other? Now, we'll be wanting to look closely what direction or what angle the calves of, of, the, of the tusks, rather, of these calves they have taken. Look at that puma. On a closer look, you can tell one tusk is shorter than the other. And this reminds me what we were being taught in college, that one tusk, if it's shorter, then it would indicate that elephants are either right-handed or left-handed. In this particular case, we would say this particular cow is right-handed. She definitely must be enjoying some good food where she is. They're not moving per se. They've just been like positioned in that one particular place for like the last, uh, I would say, 10 minutes, meaning that there's something very nutritious they're getting, much shorter than the tall grass that you see there. Definitely the tall grass there is the red oat grass. But on a closer look, I don't think that is what they are eating. Well. Elephants, when they decide to go slow, they might remain where they are for a pretty long time. And I want to find out if the smaller calf will go closer to the mother or not. But as I wait maybe to do that, I'll take you back to South Africa to Trish because I think she got a very slow moving animal. He'd surely be freaking out. He is so small and he's actually moving quite fast. So this is a serrated hinged terrapin. And I'm quite surprised to see him out here. I saw him crossing the road. Um, and usually they're a lot, they're more in, in the water than out of the water. But Vuyotela Dam is not far from us at all. So maybe he's just kind of crawled out of there and decided to get some sun. So he is, of course, cold-blooded blooded or ectothermic. So he needs to warm up with the sun. And you'll often find them just kind of basking about Oh, you've hidden yourself so well now uh, to kind of warm themselves up and he is like I said a serrated hinged terrapin and he's a bit different to what you may have seen often the speaks hinged terrapin who has the hinge on the carapace which is the top bit and his hinge is actually in the plastron which is the under bit and it's actually in the front so he can retract his neck in and close it off in the front which is quite a nice feature really really high-tech security in that house of his well as you know today oh as you don't know actually we do have steve in the tent just as soon as it's ready and we are speaking about hyenas and the hyena dens and how all that dynamic works and when it comes to this kind of serrated uh, this kind of animal and the serrated hinge terrapin he's got a den of his own and it is basically his shell <laughs> that he pulls himself into and there he goes rushing off very fast moves really fast to be honest and um, somebody else who moved very fast this week was lovely Tlalamba and she I was had the pleasure of being with her as she moved very fast and reacted really quick to moving up a tree. Let's have it. 
Little Princess Lalamba continues to grow in independence, spending more and more time away from Mother Queen Tandi. Being alone has its own set of challenges and sometimes leaves her vulnerable. But Tandi has taught her well. She was vigilant and swift in her escape from Ribbon of the Juma clan. She watched from the top of the tree until she was able to slink back down safely and once again melt into the darkness cast by the setting sun. <laughs> Wasn't that something? I really do think that Tandi has taught her well. She reacted so quickly to the hyena and the interaction between them was quite typical. She was, of course, very, very aware at first and a bit, um, not concerned, but definitely cautious. She did the right thing. I mean, if I saw Ribbon coming after me, I would probably jump up too. Yeah, we have a nice view of Weotela Dam. Nice and filled up. But there you saw the interaction between her and the hyena. And you'll find that even before she actually got pushed up into the tree, she kind of, the hyena sniffed around. <laughs> April says that hyenas always have this look like, like this innocent kind of, oh, why? Why are you scared of me? Why do you hate me? I also love it. I think it's such a cute thing, especially since they have such an incredible bite force, such an incredible immune system. They really are kind of the ultimate rugged outdoor animal. And they still have this this face like, but why don't you want to be my friend? I thought we're all friends here. I think it's just too sweet. And I especially like when you have... Um, lions at a kill or or leopards at a kill or even that day with Lalamba and they kind of just look at it, look at us and look at them and then they're like oh why aren't you sticking around be my friend be my friend I think it's absolutely cute anyway this is a lovely view of the dam and I am going to continue to search for Princess Lalamba and any hyenas we may come across in the meantime let's go over to David Well, we're just looking at the forest there because we had seen something that appeared to be a rhino, but then it turned out not to be. And Archie is telling me I forgot to remind you my name, and I don't think that's true, Archie. But just in case Archie is not pulling my leg, my name is David, and the man behind the camera who reminded me to introduce myself is Archie. Archie, good afternoon. Excellent. Now, having come out of that, I'm very excited because I have my favorite bird in the whole world. And I'm sure all of you know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the lilac breasted roller. There she is, patched up on a spotted of green bush there. But if you look carefully, the wind is trying to, oops, did I speak too early? Actually gonna try and catch up with her. Excuse me about my head. Very good job, Archie. That's the lilac breasted roller, and what I know, she's not going very far. Ooh, apparently two of them. She was not very welcome, or he was not very welcome. Now, it's very unusual to see these birds being two together. You'll only see one at a time, but once in a while, of course, you'll see what I would call a male and a female as a pair. And in general, they're always together when they are mating. Now again, as I say, this is the lilac breasted roller, and it's my favorite bird for so many reasons. The beautiful colors, they, they, they got some of the prey that they hunt. As much as they look pretty, I would say pretty small, you'll also see them going for arthropods, you'll see them going for fish, you'll see them going for frogs, you'll see them going for even snakes, you know, small little lizards. But that's one, two, when you see them mating in the air, you know, it's just a very special sighting to see them mating there. Come on, Kito, you need to move. And above all, and ab above all, when you see the mating, they'll always be mating, rolling in the air like that, like that. And that's how they ended up getting the name 
the rollers or lilac breasted rollers. Well, she has gone and I'm also going. I'll have to look for something else. But I think Isaac, who is on the other side of the Mara Triangle, got some huge grumpy animals. I'm going to look. Welcome everybody. Uh, it's a very good afternoon. A bit different um, from this morning. It's a bit windy, a bit rainy, but all in all it is a perfect setting here. I have the Cape Buffalo, a very big herd of them. A warm welcome. I'm Isaac and on camera I have Jay Andre. And I'm already at you know sausage country looking for the sausage tree pride. I hope I'll be lucky this time around. This morning, remember, we were here and I looked for them, couldn't find them, but I am back and what I came across, it's one of their favorite foods, the Cape Buffalo. If, in case you're not very familiar with the sausage tree pride, okay, something really spooked them and they have decided to take off. Lorena, yes, uh, thank you very much for appreciating the beauty that we have here. Um, this herd here looks like majority are bulls and they have, take, they have decided to take off for some reason. And sometimes when one gets spooked, it will uh, like um, make the others you know, um, you know, feel the same and sometimes they just take off for no reason. You can tell that they have stopped and I'm sure they are asking each other what happened, why did you run, you know, it was you, you started it, no, it was you, you know, I think that's what they are asking each other and arguing, not knowing exactly what transpired. It is windy and one might pick up a whiff of an old lion scent or leopard and take off. Rosalina, you ask me how many calves can buffaloes have in their life? I would assume around maybe around eight to nine because they live as long as our domestic cows, around 18, 18 years. And if you give a gestation period of around 11 months, um, I would say, you know, it's around eight, eight calves. Uh, that's what they would give birth to, eight calves. Um, gestation period is 11 months and they get weaned at around one year, one and a half. So you can give it, you know, every two years they would give birth. So uh, it's around eight, actually eight calves. Um, majority of these ones here are bulls. Bulls form what we call a bachelor group or the boys club. And Yes, so they stick together and form a coalition of bulls and protect each other. You know, while I try and get to where the sausages are, let me take you to my colleague Steve to introduce himself down in Juma. T-shirt. Skew shot. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the tent, or should I say to the graveyard, which is outside the tent and the hyena skull. My name is Steve. I'm joined by Simzo Mkize on camera. And indeed, as Trishala has told you, we are doing a hyena-themed afternoon with regards to the den sites, the interaction around the den sites, the threats imposed to these animals around the dens, and then also the interactions that the hyena have had over the years with animals in and around. So it is going to be a very, very cool afternoon. Don't forget to send your questions and comments. Hashtag Safari Live and let's see how we go. Well, let's start by going inside the tent, shall we? And, well, there's been lots of footage and I'm sure there's been footage for years and years and years. And uh, Faith has managed to put together a few packages on the dens and the interaction. I think it's impossible to be able to cover all of it. I don't think we've got two years to do so so we put together a little bit of stuff to get it all together but let's start off with a little bit of an introduction to the den sites that we know over the last few years and here if we look at this beautiful map that you're all very familiar with there's a couple of dates and a couple of question marks and these are the dens that we know of 
on Juma. Um, one of them was around over here. That's off the Zoe's Road. From 2010, Sebastian said the pe uh, animals were there. And then a number of other times they've come and gone. 2015, 2016, I'm not 100% sure. And then right up in here in the north, in the Aubrey's Junction, there was also a den site there in about 2016. Uh, then here, close to camp, just above Gallego, 2016, 2017. Uh, at some stage during that period, most of last year, the hyenas were somewhere in the north here. We're not sure. They were in Buffalsuk. They were coming and going. We didn't spend any time with them. And then out of nowhere... 2018, towards the end of the year, the Juma clan returned back to Juma. And then here in the south is where we've found them recently. Linda, a perfect place, Matt. Well, we can maybe send you a copy or two. We've gone and laminated them, and, well, they work very, very well, especially for drawing on. And we can go and wipe and rub and clean continuously. But, folks, the reason for den sites, why do hyenas have dens? And Trish touched on it briefly with the terrapin and tortoises alike. They have somewhere to hide, somewhere to secure themselves. Uh, namely, lions will spend or will have two, three, four cubs at some point, but the success rate of lions is very, very low. Cheetah as well, we've seen with Scott last year, with Kakenya, with Naratoi, we haven't had the best amount of luck with the cheetah uh, because they don't have a proper den. Whereas hyena, wild dog, they manage to dig holes in the ground associated with, obviously, the big termite mounds that we find around here. And the purpose of them is for breeding, is for the survival of their cubs. And, well, we're going to jump on board and have a little, little, little look at some clips of the den sites over the years so i'm just going to grab my little mouse over there i'm going to push play and let's have a look at this shall we okay so over the years the den sites have been obviously used by the same sorts of termite mounds 2014 please don't ask me to identify all these hyenas it's going to be hard work but it's a place for them to lie up it's a place for them to greet each other it's a place for them to secure and hide their cubs uh, where you can see they're always very very close to the den always very close to disappearing as youngsters come the youngsters go underneath the ground is beautifully beautifully sort of secure for them um, you can see how fat the bellies are after nights of foraging, coming back to suckle the youngsters who get very excited at the return of the adults, sometimes a bit nervous as others move around the den, but the safety of being inside there affords the youngsters the perfect opportunity to grow, the perfect opportunity to hide as well, and, well, it is a hive of activity for the adults, for the youngsters, a place of determining who's who in the zoo when it comes to being a hyena, and, well, as we seen the success of the hyenas over the years is generally quite good due to the fact that they're able to keep them underground where the adults can dig small holes in the ground and the youngsters can dig even further in to small cavities that will protect them or afford them protection from all of the animals that might try to do them harm. So this 2018, I'm not 100% sure where this den is. I think it's around the, uh, it's around, oh, this must be... I'm not 100% sure. This doesn't look familiar to the one around Aubrey's or the one around uh, Philemon's Dip. But um, no doubt the hyena liked... To, there we go. Food is brought back from time to time for the matriarch. And it is only the matriarch's youngsters that will be able to feed. And, uh, well, isn't that so special to be able to see hyenas around the den? And as we said, we've got one, two, three, four, five, and possibly even a sixth one uh, down here in the bottom. Uh, that's This is the one over here that James Hendry himself got caught in during the Gauntlet series not so long ago. There it is. And, um, well, we don't know how long ago that they had that. MCAT, um, hyenas don't have many, many, many cubs. They have two. Two is the average, sometimes one, but generally two. I've never heard of three. Uh, it's possible, but I've never heard of three. And who knows what goes on under the ground inside the den. The dynamics of inside dens, inside the hyena world itself, uh, there is infanticide, or should I say canism, whereby young hyenas possibly kill their siblings. It is a debate that we're not 100% sure of because no one really goes inside and explores the idiosyncrasies of hyenas at that very small 
small age. We do know that they're born with erupted teeth and they are capable of inflicting quite severe wounds on each other. And when their offspring or the, the sibling is very small, it is potentially possible for them to kill the smaller of the two, kind of the run to the litter or the... The, the upcoming female matriarch, she might be able to do that. The daughter of the matriarch might kill her sibling as a sort of aggression sort of stage building up. It is something people discuss. It is something that is very interesting to sort of think about, but I've never seen anything like that. We do know that underground, the, the, the safety afforded to hyenas is awesome, but obviously the safety afforded to them from their siblings trying to kill them, well, there's not much you can do, but that's the rivalry and the desire to become important in Ahina Den. And if you're not able to survive the early stages, well, then you'll never be able to survive into the future of the clan where but the hierarchy, the dominance, and all of those idiosyncrasies are going to constantly, constantly plague that individual for the rest of their life. But anyway, while we continue to discuss and think about hyenas in the Juma, there are also plenty of hyena in the Masai Mara, as David Gitu will surely be able to tell you. Well, I don't remember the last time I saw hyenas eating birds. And when I call hyenas predators, just like cheetahs and leopards and lions, those other predators will always be sneaking, even on birds like what we have here, but maybe not hyenas. Well, I got two species of birds here, and I stopped here. I was with the three pieces because of their feeding habit. And if you look at them very carefully, we got two that are on the left, that either they know what they're looking for, and you can see the speed of eating. Oops, there's something there that must have spoken them they didn't like. And these are the sacred ibis. And you can see how the beaks are shaped, sharp and long, because they need to shoot in the water, and whatever they grab, they have like either to subdue it before they swallow it, so that it disappears in there. And ideally, most of the ibises, be it sacred ibis, hadara ibis, or the green ibis, most of these particulars are always associated in the water. They do more, more so the hadara ibis and the sacred ibis, because uh, the green ibises, you'll always see them in the forest in general, but hadara ibis and the sacred ibis, they tend to live on crustaceans in the water. And I'm sure either small fish or frogs is what she's getting there. Now let's look at the egrets. They're very still, they're very patient. They only move very slowly and quietly. That does not mean you're going to feed anywhere while you're going away. And look at their patience. So I don't know why she moved out of the water or maybe she has noticed this is the great egret, by the way. And either she need to look carefully, the other one follows suit. And she, yep, very good. And we've got a heron now. Now the heron, black-headed heron and the great egret, they have commonalities. All is very patient. Sherry, thank you for your comment. You're saying how beautiful. Apparently, Sherry, I had not seen the heron until Archie did put it on the frame. And it's so beautiful, Sherry, to have three different species just next to each other. Now, water is what has brought them together, or basically food, because we have always seen here in Africa, or maybe practically all over the world, water is life. So I am imagining all types of crustaceans you would think of are in this water from frogs to worms, talk of, say, fish, any invertebrates that you could think of must be in here. Now, the egret, that's the one between those two sacred ibis. See the tall one there that's moving? Always very patient. Now, the great egret tend to remain around the water for feeding, but the cattle egret are always away from the water. Nikki, you would like to know whether these ones are related to the geese, and they are not. They are not related to the geese at all, because ideally, Nikki, when you look at these ones here, they are feeding, I would say, at the moment, they're carnivores. So they are catching either worms or, as I, say, as I said, frogs in the water, any, any living organism, any crustaceans in the water, that's what they're feeding on. But most geese, you'll see them feeding on leaves, on flowers, on seeds, and they're kind of vegetarian. So apparently, Nikki, they are not related at all. It's the great regret. So you notice the ibis, the sacred ibis, is busy, busy knowing what's looking for. 
but the egret has to wait very patiently until something moves for it to jump on it. If actually you go to the right again and you look at the heron, you'll see how, how patient the heron is. Right, you see the heron, the black-headed heron there? Very, very patient. And I think every time anybody is close to water, there's a possibility of something happening, as also Trish is close to some water in South Africa in Juma. I am at, at the water. On a hot day like this, it's not a bad bet to be at the water. Animals want to stay cool like us. And we had Scuba Steve there, who's not minding the intrusion from these wonderful birds either. So here we have a yellow bull stalk. Look at the concentration on the face. Oh, caught something. No. No, go again. Very entertaining. And then next to him, we have a spoon bull off to the left there doing the same now see how they look so similar but uh, in a lot of ways their beaks sort of are adapted to different things i think it's very cool now the spoon bull one would think if the spoon is so successful at the end of the of the bowl, why don't other other birds have it? I think that's quite a question. Something is something to think about. But my my theory is that the spoon at the end of it, at the end of the spoon bowl, um, actually helps it to maybe push aside water. You know, maybe because it's thick, more like an oar. I don't know. But see how a a good resource can attract a lot of animals to one area. And that's exactly what you're seeing here now. Because this dam is nice and filled up and there's lots of invertebrates and bits of algae floating in the water. And there we have a heron right at the edge there. Very cool. Now, F's here says to me that this is a saddle bull stalk. Let's go back to it and have a good look. This one here, BK. The one that I said is a yellow bull stalk. <laughs> FC says cancel that. Intel was wrong. I thought so. To me, let's actually have a good look in the book and I'll show you why I thought it was a yellow bull stalk because aha it looks exactly like the picture yep it does i do know why fc thought that though because there is a saddle built stock that i have seen around that kind of looks a little bit pale um and it could easily be mistaken for the yellow bull stalk. I don't know why it's sort of ma uh, missing the black patch around here. So easily mistakeable, mistakeable. And um, but thank you for watching so closely, FC. Thank you very much. Anyway, we are here to learn about characters, and that's what I want to tell you all about today. And I have spent a lot of time with the Inkahumas the last few days, and with the Avokas the last few days as well. And I remember fondly when I had the pleasure of seeing them on a water buck kill. So let's recap and let's have a look at that and see exactly what went down. The Inkahumas succeeded in bringing down a handsome water buck for a much needed early morning meal. Hyenas lurked in the distance, seemingly afraid to challenge the large pride for the meal. The pride's poor table manners and squabbling at the breakfast frenzy is typical. Once satiated, it was off to the nearby watering hole to slake their thirst. Finally, the pride regrouped to reaffirm their social bonds and take a well-deserved cat nap. 
quite something to watch, especially like the part where the one lioness kind of moves off with the horns, as if to say, this is my prize. I'm taking it and I'm keeping it on my mantle. Well, you should tell him that the bad habit, don't keep animal horns on your mantle. No, don't you, don't you agree, Scuba Steve? I hope you do. Well, I'm going to move away from here now. I was hoping that maybe we'd see sort of maybe some lions coming to drink, some elephants coming to drink, and maybe Salamba coming to drink, but no luck yet. Jeez, it looks like I'm about to drive through a bird tornado. Can you see this? Wow. There must be a whole heap of tiny little things in the air that they're all chasing. Can you see that? It really does look like a bird tornado. So cool. <laughs> this is really, really cool. Anyway, moving off. In the meantime, let us go back to the hostess with the mostess, Steve. Thanks, Trish. Well, I had some insects this morning myself that went into my mouth again like the other day. And Seb tried to record me nearly vomiting again. It's one of those things that's time you lots of flying insects coming out of the ground. Who knows? Is it just not just termites, all sorts of other things. But it's not only the hyenas that have homes and tortoises. We also have giant land snails, which uh, like to hide inside there. There's a bit of protection. It smells quite quite funky in there. And other organisms could actually use live inside there. Like if you think of hermit crabs and things like that, will actually utilize the, the homes of others. So squatters, if you will. But um, talking about squatters, um, is it true or is it false? Hukumuri, the interloper from the West, materialized last week with myself and Senzo. He came out of nowhere. We were told he was coming in. We drove in to see if we could find him. And well, he certainly, certainly did. Rain has washed away territorial smells, and with the absence of the Duke, Hukumuri moved into a seemingly vacant western Juma. Eager to leave his mark, Hukumuri scent marked vigorously, taking time to enjoy the fragrance of some dwarf sage as he moved with purpose in a straight line through the central western parts of Juma. Hukumuri's presence, although a threat to Tengana's offspring, offers much needed diversity to the leopard gene pool. He investigated every lingering smell as he went. Excitingly, Hukumuri's patrol brought him and us directly to the new Juma Den. Corky, the matriarch, was quick to spot the looming danger as she moved in to confront the threat. This fearsome male leopard decided against standing his ground, instead skulking away from this protective hyena mother and matriarch. Hukumuri composed himself and continued his patrol south, giving the Juma Den a very wide berth. How awesome was that? We spent two drives with him. I actually was mistaken. I forgot it wasn't Sense. It was BK, in fact, that we found. And, well, Hukumuri definitely came in after the rains. He definitely was scent marking. He was definitely here. He wants to stay. Uh, Tingana's probably going to call him a squatter, but uh, he's definitely trying to... Put his mark in on the western side and it was quite interesting to see how exactly he moved because um he came in over here where did he come in we found him where were we now we found him over here the night before so he came in from the west came in there and we followed him all the way through to here and we left him sort of on this area here in the night in the morning we came back and we found him running down this road directly towards us. And uh, then we actually found tracks earlier that, well, later that day, that were from him. He was up and down Aubrey's Road in the west here. And then there were tracks of Tingana up and down this road in the west, uh, a bit east. And then Tingana actually went all the way straight down here and out at Twin Dams, whereas Hukumuri came straight down, straight through the middle and uh, past Treehouse Dam and then to the new den, which is over here. And then he disappeared 
out through the side there. Giraffe girl, yes, I, we were so excited when he found it. I mean, we were following him for the longest time, getting in front, getting in front, getting those really awesome images of, um, of him walking, and that's just a powerhouse of a cat as he walks so nonchalantly, not bothered by anybody, and then suddenly he stopped. And we didn't see it initially. Rexon was just in front of us. He said, hyena den. He'd obviously seen the youngsters go down, and then suddenly Corky... The brave female that she is, she just came charging in completely. No risk to her. She just goes, Hukumuri, you better move on, young sir. And he was very quick to turn and run from her attentions. Seeing him cower like that was quite something. JST Child, do you want to know if Hassan is dispersed? Well, he seems to have for now. Um, he did one of these walkabouts last year. He went all the way down to sort of the Londolosi area, about 20-odd kilometers south of us. He came back up through Elephant Plains, and then he just materialized back here. I think it was about two-and-a-half-month, three-month jaunt he went on. And I think now, with Hukumuri pushing in from the east, uh, sorry, from the west, uh, there's activity with the quarantine pushing in from the east against Tingana. Tingana's battling up in the north against Gaj uh, there's that unknown male uh, just south of the den that we saw on the last TV show the week before last, and he came out of nowhere. So I think Hassan is suddenly finding himself in the middle of this sort of uh, battle for the territory, and he's also starting to get a little bit sort of brave himself. He's scent marking, he's t tasting the urine, he's, he's trying to make a go of it, but it's time for him to walk away, and it's time for him to go and see if he can find a territory of his own. And also a little bit of travel will do him good. He'll experience new places, he'll meet new ladies he'll move away from his relatives which is a good thing uh, from a gene pool you want to you don't want leopards to stay too close because otherwise they'll start mating with cousins and with sisters and things like that it doesn't happen in hyenas hyenas disperse they push themselves away and you'll always find males moving to other dens where females will stay so it's a natural process with leopards uh, males in lions and leopards, they move away until they're eventually big enough and strong enough to then say, I've had enough, I'm going to stand my ground here. I mean, Hosanna doesn't even have any battle scars. It doesn't even have a little bit of a, a battle scar. He'll get them. He's going to meet up with a few leopards. He's going to stand his ground one day. He's going to stand his ground on a kill. Um, I suppose he's just no match for Tingana at the moment. And so maybe he should go off and find an area that's vacant. Because as many of you have suggested, Tingana is still going to be around for another year or so. And while it's time for Hosanna to spread his wings and maybe move away and then in a year come back. Who knows? Who knows? Maybe he'll do that. The cool, the world's coolest leopard by far. Well, it was really so cool for us to have seen the Juma Den that day with Corky and then to find out that June, in fact, uh, is the mother of those two youngsters because how special it is to find a very low-ranking female. So it's going to be so cool to be watching how Plonk and those two youngsters interact with each other around the den to see if they do pick up their mom's rank and how exactly Plonk sorts them out because the last time we saw them, Plonk was getting an absolute earful from the two of them. But anyway, David is up in the Mara. He's found some very cool animals, the topi, and hopefully they're avoiding some predators. Well, Steve has been talking about leopard's dynamics, and I got one of the antelopes that leopards love both here in the Mara Triangle and excuse me about my head I don't think anybody wants to see my head and in Juma while Juma they do not have the topies they have sesame as well in South Africa but then further across if actually you can find it further across the other different yes that particular area you can see we got our water bucks in the background there very good now what I'm saying I got three different types of antelopes here and of the three I have seen leopards bring down impalas I've seen leopards bring down impala I mean um, the toppies but I do not remember the last time I saw leopards bring down water bucks lions every other time I would want Isaac and uh, you know Trish and uh, Steve to remind me you know how do leopards actually bring uh, water bucks down uh, as often you know I mean you all know today is our safari live afternoon on our sunset drive and we have some action packed of all what we saw uh, last week or the best experiences we saw last week and seeing lions to me is always special but seeing lions with cubs like what I saw last week was extraordinary 
A new day broke in the Mara Triangle, and the sausage tree pride as its typical lions out for a morning stroll. The newest addition to the pride was proudly introduced to the rest of the family. The adorable fluff ball was wobbly and unsteady on its feet, but eager to explore its new world. The next day, we caught up with the pride again on the morning walk, and this time we were thrilled to notice that Kingtail has rejoined the pride after keeping us in suspense for some time. These bundles of joy were bursting with energy and zest of life. The youngest cub was no exception. After a morning out, the moms decided it was time to retreat to the safety of the long grass, just in case. we've hit our jackpot of the day and we've come across the sausages uh, it was rather you know um, stressful going all around there but finally here they are and they are all five females of the sausage tree pride the three older cubs and the four new ones belonging to Mickey in case you're joining us for the first time this is the sausage tree pride they have five females and the oldest one is kinky tail i don't know where she is she's amongst these ones she will have to you know stand up and walk so i can identify her by her trade back the kink in her tail and then the rest are her four daughters and all their cubs the cubs you're looking there were born about seven weeks ago and they have a very incredible story where, you know, three, we thought there were three originally, and then after almost one week, another one appeared, and it looked like it had a back, a bad back leg, but eventually it healed, and it has made a very good comeback, and it's doing very, very well. That is Kinky Tail, and Mr. Tech, you're asking how many cubs are there in a pride. It differs from one pride to another. Uh, it can be as many as 15. I have seen as many as 15 before. Uh, depends on how many females give birth. Sometimes they do synchronize their meetings. So when they give birth, they will give birth almost with a difference of only a few weeks. And so if it's five females and each gives birth to around three, there will be around 15 in total, so there can be very many cups depending on how many females are found in a pride. In here, in total, um, I think we have around you know, three older cups, four new ones, that is seven, plus one, that is eight. So we have around eight cups at the moment. Um, we are expecting more. Uh, there's another female that um, was pregnant. I don't know if she's going to give birth. So we are expecting more. We might have more than 10 cubs. And uh, female lionesses cross circle each other's young. And that's the reason why they give us almost at the same time of the year. Um, it gives a better survival rate because if one female is not there, then the other one will you know, cro you know, cross circle the cubs. And so survival rates becomes much, much better. And Kimberly, you say it's a cuddle puddle. <laughs> it might seem like it, but it could be rather a dangerous cuddle. Uh, to, uh, to stay away from these cats, you know, they might look very cuddly, but you wouldn't want to be cuddly one, otherwise you'd become the next meal. So it's would prefer to look for a big teddy bear or, you know, big fluffy. Uh, stuffed thing, you know, um, rather than cuddle this, these guys. They look like they're quite content, the sausage tree pride. So, you know, they ate, they, uh, they have perfected their hunting skills and we know them for bringing down uh, Cape Buffalo. But we haven't seen them kill Buffalo for the last two weeks. 
Um, we don't know what they ate, but they look quite well fed. Um, I'm wondering, you know, maybe what they eat, but maybe it could be uh, maybe a topi or a few warthogs, because at this time of day, these girls are usually very active. Joy in Hong Kong, um, you're saying if, um, I don't know if I understand your question well, if we can identify kinky tails cubs. Well, she's got uh, two very, very small ones. They were seen by my colleague David about um, three days ago. Um, I don't know if they're here, but if not, they're not very far because these girls, um, unlike other, you know, lionesses that I've seen before, who hide their cubs in one place for a few weeks, then move around with them, go pick them and move them. These girls move around with their cubs. A very unique kind of behavior with this pride. You know, I've seen them, you know, going to a kill with very young cubs. They're very different. So this, um, this pride, I would say, you know, kinky tail cubs are not very far from here um, because they move around with them. And when Gigi, my colleague, saw them with them, Yes, you know, when Gigi saw them, they were all together. So I'm thinking they're still together. So, you know, while I stick out here and see what's going to happen, maybe in the next few minutes, let's take you to Steve and see what's happening with some hyena. Well, thank you, Isaac. It is so special to be able to see all of that on screen and just to watch that clip with those little youngsters. This is so heartwarming. It just wants to make you melt, doesn't it? That little one. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> it's just the cutest things in the world. And Isaac's 100% right about how they communally suckle. Lions will have two, three, four cubs, and then they can assist each other in the rearing of their cubs. Hyenas will not. A hyena mum will have two, and if she somehow dies or disappears or whatever happens, well, those cubs are going to starve. So they are her responsibility 100%. And being around the den, it is mum's responsibility to come back and suckle them. And talking about the den sites, again, um, we haven't seen Pretty, so we don't know where Pretty's two cubs are. I mean, it's possible that because um, they were denning south of our boundary, somewhere in a, a little gallery over here. We don't know where exactly, but the, the, the vehicles down south were quite adamant that they were all denning down at one stage, and now they have disappeared completely. So maybe uh, Pretty with her youngsters is somewhere nearby still, because uh, I haven't seen her at the den. Senzo seems to think he might have seen uh, Pretty's two youngsters there yesterday, but that would be interesting to go back and have a look at that, because well, we haven't seen Pretty in those two games. I haven't in some time. But, well, when it comes to hyenas and the purpose of the den, the den is obviously for protection and protection from all sorts of things because it comes from the big, from the small. And we're going to have a quick look at a little clip to show you exactly what sort of threats and interesting facts happen around these den sites. So we're just going to frame up here, Sens, and um, we're just going to then push play. And there we go, ready with a little head poking out. So the threats come in large shapes, such as elephants, who clearly aren't too much of a danger, but the inquisitiveness of the cubs doesn't mean they're going to come out and sniff the feet of an elephant. But wild dogs, well, one-on-one, -on -one, a wild dog is probably much easily overpowered by a hyena, but they do sort of bring forward a united front, and they will kill hyena cubs if they can. Uh, obviously, the den site allows the cubs protection, and they will go underneath when frightened, as you'll see here. This lioness, probably of the Unkuhumas, it's hard to say. This is the den site just north of Galago. This lioness came in... The, Adults are out of there. They're not going to stand their ground against her. We've seen the Unkuhumas deal, the, uh, the hyenas here, huge blows. They don't come anywhere near them. And she would very, very readily eat one of those cubs if she should get it out. But they do bury themselves in very, very deep into small little cavities and little escapes, which is how hyenas are able to be quite successful in the rearing of their cubs. But the danger lurking around the den cannot be overestimated or underestimated as this evokes. Male, if you don't want to watch, turn away now. Gave Corky a proper, proper hiding here. But she managed to catch him on the end of the mouth at one point here. And, well, how he didn't kill her is just testament to the ability and the resilience of these individuals. 
and around the den site, lions, leopards are the biggest threat as well as obviously wild dog who can come through. So very, very interesting. The threats that abound around hyena dens, I'm sure there have been thousands over the years here, but the safety of their home, the safety of the den really, really works well because the adults can just book it and get out of there. Corky, I think, stood her ground for a little bit too long. Um, I wasn't in the sighting. Senza, you were there, eh? No. It was Sydney. But um, she stood her ground for a little bit longer than she should have when before you saw that last lioness came. The hyenas were gone. So better to just run away. That, that big male lion's not going to get those cubs from out of that hole. He just won't. He might have a go, but he won't get in there. They can dig, but nowhere near as efficiently as hyenas can with their claws. But uh, the den site and the su suitability of them obviously could cause uh, hyenas to move if the threats increase around the den. For example, uh, leopards and lions making regular visits to a den site might cause them to move off. Um, Sorry, Faith, I didn't quite get that question there. But um, so the choice of the den, obviously we've seen uh, the Juma den moved from that site where the Evoca male attacked Corky. They disappeared and then they came back again, which is very high, very happy about that. So, Mrs. Zera, you want to know why they matriarchal, not patriarchal? And that's very interesting. It's one of those sort of evolutionary things that has happened along the way. Um, the females have sort of, through a matriarchal system, how that developed initially is very hard to really wrap your head around it. But it obviously got something to do with the size of the females. Um, a dominant female has generally got more testosterone in her, which is actually injects it into her in birth. And it often is brought about by her mother. If her mother's dominant, she's often injected with a little, little bit more testosterone in the womb, just like males would be, but a little bit more, which means that they come out bigger and stronger. But it's one of those sort of niches that they fitted into in the environment. I mean, if you think about lions, lions are essentially led by the females and they look after the cubs and the males basically just come and go. Uh, hyenas have established a very, very solid society underneath a lead female and it's because of her offspring moving forward that the clan proliferates. So over many, many, many millennia that's probably evolved being a successful or strong female has had cubs and those cubs have sort of followed her line but where in history that started is very hard to say because they are the only sort of communal hyena that we know about um, and they are quite unique in in everything that they do and there's so many dynamics behind it it makes it very hard to really understand you need to spend time at the den to see how they interact with each other to see how the dominance is displayed between females between the males and um, it's just a very long evolution history, but I'm not 100% sure exactly how it came about. Um, they lead the clan, I suppose, but there's aggression there. When you see elephants, females also are matriarchs, they lead the clan. There's not really that much aggression. There's more sort of sort of a, an understanding between them, sort of almost like what we see in humans, more of a, of a passed down lineage, whereas hyena, it's all about dominance, it's all about aggression, and it's all about who's bigger than who in the, the hyena world. So I hope that explains your answer, your question there. Alex, people don't understand hyenas, and I think many of the viewers and many of you back home, and maybe you included, uh, after watching the show, have, have developed a love for them. They are, you know, initially, and you look at them in, in, in children's sort of uh, comics such as The Lion King and in all sorts of other sort of depictions of them, they are scavengers, they are the, the lowest of the low on the earth, and they're dirty, and they look funny, and so people have just got a very bad image of them over the years, but when you spend time with them inside their society and you see how dynamic they are. I mean, you compare the Juma Den with the North Clan, there's just so many differences between how they behave and, and how they hunt and how they interact with lions. And they really are a very, very dynamic and diverse organism that has evolved on the African plains, fitted into a niche that probably um, happened many, many years ago. We're not sure about the origin, if they came from Europe, if they came from Africa, but they fitted into a period of time when the saber-toothed tigers were basically killing animals but not able to eat all of the bones or the fur or the flesh and because of the very strange teeth and so hyenas fits it into this niche whereby they were scavenging 
but slowly over time that dynamic of a sort of a hierarchy developed to make them one of the most successful predators on the African plains and going right deep down into the hierarchy of them and the dynamics and the footage we've put forward really starts to develop a little bit of a of a love for them everyone looks at cats and goes oh we love our cats we love lions but lions are bigger scavengers than hyena are really and that male lion who tried to kill corky there he's a he's a cheeky boy okay well, i think i might have lost comms there but um sense Okay, so it seems like Senzo is going to have to change his battery soon, Faith. So if we can possibly link over to someone, that would be great while we sort that out. And, um, okay, so we're going to go back up to the Masamara so David can continue his discussion. But I think he's found for you some olive baboons. Yes. Without uh, people understanding the hyenas better, you know, you might always think they're ugly animals and not the best animals to have around. But now I decided now to look a bit uh, for some primates and I got olive baboons. And like this afternoon, I'm seeing things either in parties earlier. I had a party of birds. They had the sacrodiabes, they had the egrets, and the black-headed heron together. But also here, I got the baboons, I got impalas, and I also got the waterbucks. All of them more or less in the same area. And again, just like the party of birds they had earlier, they've been brought here by one commonality, food. Waterbucks, as the name suggests, always very close to water, feeding near water, drinking a lot. And this is the defas waterbuck. We've got two types of waterbucks in Kenya. This one and another type that we call the common waterbuck. To the baboons that direction they're going, they're going towards the forest, and that is towards the Mara River, which has very huge trees, like what Archie is just about to show you. And coming to darkness or coming to the end of the day, having spent the better part of the day foraging, they'll always close in, choose a particular tree and they'll all climb that tree and they spend the night, the whole night on top of a tree until morning. I've always respected baboons and most monkey, monkeys because of the balance of staying up on top of a tree for like what, 10, 11 hours until daybreak for them to come down and again out and about to start foraging and moving. Either chasing each other or just like, you know, it's time to go up, look for some bedding place and catch the last insects before darkness falls. They'll get tubers, they'll get rhizomes from the ground, roots from the grass. Kitty, that's correct. And I'm happy to say, to hear you call it a troop because a group of baboon is called a troop. Very well done. And by any standard, Kitty, before, you know, uh, Faith, who is in the final you know, control doing the directing of the show today before she came to me, Kitty, I counted 65 baboons, 65. So this is a massive congress of baboons. And I'm sure, Kitty, you had me saying this particular species is called the olive baboon. In Kenya, we also got another type that is called the yellow baboon. And apparently all what you're watching now is the bums, and I'm sure... Archie is doing a lot of bum shots. I see they are slowly disappearing in the grass. So most of them, what you see, are males. And I'm sure the one on the right there on your screen, you can see a bit of red bum on her. That one is a female. The two big ones to the left there are males. And that one walking away there, females will always have red bottoms. When mating, they're always bright red or bright pink. And they're always showing the males they're in estrus and of course ready to mate so slowly they have disappeared in those orange leafed croton bushes and then the trees in the background there they are going to choose one of them depending on the leader to go up and they will be bedding there they always have a leader they're very matriarchal and then they're gonna spend the night there my friend uh, isaac is in the Society Republic, and I'm not very sure how he's doing. I'll give you one more look of that particular waterbuck. Let's find out whether Isaac is winning or not with the sausages. Welcome back to Sausage Republic, and here we still got a sausage tree pride. And that little guy is 
drinking, you know, clinging on its mother's teeth with a swag and with a style. Normally they don't drink like that, but I think it's got a, gotten a comfortable spot and it has decided to drink in style. Maybe the milk tastes different when it drinks like that. Yeah, remember to engage me in any questions about this pride. Um, this is Sauce Tree Pride and we have been following them for quite a while. And actually, um, I did uh, give out some wrong information which I would like to correct and tell you that um, I don't remember who had asked how many cups we have in total. Uh, it is 10 cups. Uh, 10 cups. I have uh, recounted and there are 10. We are missing 3 here. It is 10 cups. It's 3 of the older ones and then 4 of Mitty's, Mitty's cups. Uh, the older ones belong to a female we call Limpy two of them and one belongs to a female we haven't given her a name we're still thinking and then four belong to Romit thank you for your question Romit um, the three older cubs are males and then the meat is one is a male I have seen one is a male I don't know the rest two so I can 100% tell you we have four young males. I don't know if the rest, uh, six of the cubs, how many are, f are males. So I'm not sure of the six, but I know of the four that I've uh, seen here are males. Yes, uh, the older ones are all males and they're doing very well. It's going to be very interesting when they get older. So I was counting for you. We have uh, no, four from Mitty, two from uh, Limpy, one from a female that... Uh, we haven't given our name. Kinky has got two, and then another female has given birth to one. So in total, we have 10 cubs of different ages from six months to three weeks. So different ages of, you know, you know, in this pride. And we are very, 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 very grateful. I hope, you know, most of them will reach maturity. Mortality rate is very high. But with a pride like this, they have been doing very well. Um, and I can see the way they are treating their cubs. It might seem that, you know, like all of them might make it. But who am I to say anything? We just have to wait and see. Remember, the migration of wildebeest is coming quite soon. And these guys have started eating meat. And so they're going to have a feast. And hopefully, if they make it through the migration time, um, then they'll be big enough to be able to move even further and the survival rate increases by you know a very big percentage these two are really really going for the milk yeah you can tell that Gemma um, I don't know if it was or when do we name or what are we going to name um, we haven't decided to name her because um, of many reasons one of them is um, she doesn't have any distinguishing marks on her so we still have to get to know her more maybe know her character and then a name will pop sometimes we just name them because we like them and we name them after people we love. But over here, each one of them has been given a name because of, you know, uh, maybe a default in her, like Kinky, she's got a kink in her tail. Limpy, she was limping for a very long time. Mitty, she loves to climb trees. And the other female, you know, we don't have, don't have a name for her. So that's how we name them and we are hoping in the near future we'll have a name for her so don't you worry stay tuned and we might have a very you know a very good name that will actually portray who she is so yes yeah, so you know we'll have an, a name you know for her that suits her so let's give, give her a little bit more time and we might have a good name for her so while i continue being here so don't you worry let me take you to trishala who's driving around i hope she gets lucky soon
How cute is that? Jealous, just a little bit. But we know absolutely cute, of course. But it doesn't start there. It definitely doesn't. There's such a process of mating and dynamics that go on between the coalitions, the prides, the females, the males. So much. <laughs> Look at this. We have our own migration happening on this side. Can you get it, BK? We'll get back to the lines in a moment. I just want to show you this because this is quite a sight. So we've got uh, some Impala, well, mostly Impala there. We've got some Inyala in there. We've got uh, a wildebeest, as Goli says, has an identity crisis amongst them as well. And they're sort of making, I think they're finally moving off to quarantine. At night, they often kind of all congregate on quarantine where it's open and uh, that's where they spend the night. And as you can see right there, it is pretty open. There's not much thick bush around. So it means that they can listen out a bit better in this wind and they're a bit more protected from predators. This is very cute. Look at all of you working together. Taking it slow and easy. Well, I have checked the northern section of the of the reserve. I've checked the eastern section of the reserve and now I'm going to go down south and hopefully end up at the hyena den. But and of course I hope the cubs are out. But like I was talking about the cubs, it doesn't all start like that. It has to begin with the whole mating ritual and them getting together. And of course the incessant mating for those days that uh, follow the actual conception because all that ovulation has to be uh, initiated. They've got to bring the female into estrus and bring her, or rather bring a female into her, a state of ovulation when she is in estrus. So all that takes a lot of time, a lot of energy. And I was lucky enough to see that interaction between the avoca male and the purple eyed female of the Incohumas. So let's have a closer look at that one. And you guys can see exactly how the cubs come about. The evokers showed that they still have a firm grip on their territory here in Juma. Despite looking worse for wear with facial injuries and a pronounced limp, this evoker boldly announced his presence. He proceeded to spend an amorous few days doing his best to sire cubs in a noisy affair with the purple-eyed in Kahuma. Quite an intense affair, don't you think? The whole, sort of, I'm sure you've seen the neck bite over there too. And a lot of the time it does look like it's just a ritualistic gnaw at her neck. It seems quite brutal. But in fact, it's actually thought that maybe that can stimulate ovulation some way or the other because it seems that something that it's something that distinctly happens every single time lions mate. And, as, and even when leopards mate, they do this bit of a neck bite very intense but it's a wonderful thing to actually watch Daniela would like to know if pregnant lionesses also hunt yes they do there's we I know that or we suspect that amber eyes is pregnant she's almost definitely pregnant um, and she's still still engaged in hunting because remember it's a it's a, a group effort so though she might not be involved in the actual sprint of it she may be on the flanks they tend to do that you'll have one that's um kind of sprinting towards an animal you have animals on the flanks that kind of come in at strategic times and points um, and those animals uh can be pregnant uh, it's not it's not as if they're they're not like humans and feel the need to be 
secluded at home and out of stress and all of that sort of thing when they are pregnant. And the gestation period is fairly short. It's about 110 days. So they are, and the reason it is that short because they have what's called altricial cubs, which means that they're born with their eyes closed and they're kind of very vulnerable at that time. So they, they have the short days gestation period so they don't have to be weighed down by the pregnancy a lot of the time. And all that kind of comes into play when, when they're hunting. But thank you so much for that question. In the meantime, now that we've seen how this actually happens, let's go back to Isaac with those playful, playful cubs. Yes, Mitty has decided that she doesn't have more milk to offer. She stood up and now she's lying down again. I don't know if you know, she's going to allow them to drink again. They're moving in. Looks like she's going to. Yeah. Playtime. You know, it's nice to see these little guys playing with mom like this. You know, you can't believe that. Yeah, I know there'll be future killers. Yeah. Yeah, every now and then I'll just go quiet to let you enjoy it. Cherie, you see you could watch them all day. I agree totally. You know, when they're playful like this and young like this, they're so adorable. You get glued to them. I know you just want to watch them. This tiny little guy is the survivor. That one there and that one is the pale one. There was one when they were very young, they were about only about a month. It was very pale, that is the one, to the last one there, and he's a male. And then that one was the one that was really crying that night that I saw, I heard in the noise and realized there were four. We all thought there were three, um, but you know, we realized, you know, on the fifth night that there were four and he was crying, trying to climb on this bank. That was the last one. You notice that they have moved from this female, Mitty, and they have moved to the other female there who's Kinky. Kinky is not their maternal mother, he's like a grandmother, but they are going to beg for milk, you see, yeah? they want to drink from her, and she has no problem with that. Yeah, it is so beautiful to see this happening. Unlike other animals, lions are one of the few that would do this, they would cross circle each other's young. Yeah. I don't think she's very comfortable, that's why she's rolling from one side to the other. She doesn't want, you know, that position is very comfortable. She doesn't want uh, to leave at the same time. Maybe she doesn't have too much milk, so that's why she's rolling, uh, you know, she rolled twice. Remember, this is coming to you live, live, live from the Masai Mara in Kenya. And um, with the sausage tree pride, remember to engage me. Yes, you are cookie. You ask, you know, that uh, if that cub is, got, is muddy or that is its natural color, no, it's got a bit of mud on it, so it's uh, slightly darker. Um, it was playing in mud, so it's slightly darker because of the mud. That's not its natural color. Thank you for asking me. Yes, um, uh, look at that pose, so cute. Yeah, the older cubs are approaching. Kimberly, you say that the little guys make your heart smile. Thank you very much. They do also for me, and I hope they do for everybody. There is something about small animals. They're very, very adorable. And they're so innocent, and that's they look they give you and that's why everybody really loves you know to see them 
Inca that mommy, uh, grandma play with her, uh, you know, grandchildren. That's really cute. It's really cute. Yeah, I think she doesn't have much milk. That's why she's not very happy there. She was growling. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm just waiting for that moment. You know, normally when after drinking, they'll get very playful. I'm hoping they're going to do that. You know, and it looks like it's the beginning. Uh, that is Survivor. Um, he's doing quite well. It's really nice to see him after a round. You know, I haven't seen him for about two weeks. It's really nice. And that is the boy, you know, the pale one. He's a male. You can tell at the back he's got, you know, the two gadgets. So, you know, he's a male. Larina, you see, you love to hear the little guys talking, yes. Yes, they can't get very vocal sometimes. And actually, after being playful, they do get aggressive to each other, and that's when they really get vocal. Yeah, really cute. Look at that. I hope you're really enjoying this. It's not always that you find cubs are very playful like this, or actually cubs. You might see lions, but to see female lionesses and their cubs all together, it's really cute. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, these are skills that uh, they will be useful in the years to come. You know, those swatting, you might use them to bring down an animal, you know, and also fighting if it's a male. They're very flexible lions, even at an old age. And like us, we get stiff, can move much. Lions are always very flexible. And these two guys are very playful. Some, some you, I understand, you're very young, but you have a very good question. You asked me if they sleep the same amount of hours like adults do. Yes, they do. Um, you see, right now, they are with the comfort of their grandmother and their mothers, and so they can play. But once it's hunting time and the females have to go far, they'll tuck them somewhere and leave them and sometimes they will go even for 15 hours looking for something even for a day looking for something then come back so during that time the little guys know that they need to stay put or stay in one position and all they do then is sleep 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 and more sleep so they do sleep the same amount of hours as adults yeah that's really cute look at that <laughs> Yeah. It can get rough sometimes. Yeah. When they're playing like that, it can get a little bit rough. You know, it's really nice you know, to see them play like this. Baby girl, you ask, you know, when did the sausage trees, sausage tree pride, you know, last eat? Um, to be very frank with you, the last time I saw them eating was 14 days ago. That is when they had killed a big buffalo. But it looks like they have eaten something which I don't know. So the last meal I really have proof was 14 days. They look very well fed. Looks like they ate something about maybe a day. Yesterday I'd say they ate something. They look very, very well fed. So they did eat something. But the last proof that I saw was 14 days. Well, you know, sausages, we know them very well. At this time of day, if they hadn't eaten anything, they'd be very, very active. And I can see we have more buffalo um, in the last two days, you know, around this area. So maybe their next meal will be a buffalo because they, we know them as very good buffalo hunters. Mm. Yeah, 
This is um, cuteness galore over here. Cuteness overload. Little guys, you know, really you know, playing. Sister and brother. The one to the left is a male. The other one heading is a female. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we have yeah, this uh, older brother has just come in. Uh, him, I don't know if he's going to be allowed to really play with them. Okay, let me give you a break. Let me tell you, send you to Steve, who's got some uh, uh, hyenas. Well, thank you, Isaac. I can't help but just keep staring at the screen there while you've got these beautiful little cubs playing. And really, that one youngster is so dark. I don't think I've ever seen a little lion cub so dark in color. I mean, maybe just the contrast with the pale lioness there, but very, very interesting. And, well, when they're playing like that, it's obviously after a little bit of milk. They just sort of get full of beans and they run around. I think it, all of you back home who've got kids know there's that moment where the kids go a bit crazy after dinner with the sugar rush. They run around and then suddenly... <laughs> they go down. Well, as Isaac says, the lionesses, when they go off to hunt, will just leave them in the long grass somewhere where they will potentially be safe. Obviously, it's one of those risks of being a lion. Uh, the success of their, of their offspring is determined by where they leave them and are there any threats coming around. And we've seen the threats that approach hyenas, and obviously they've got the dens underground to be able to associate, to be able to save themselves from predators. But then around the dens is also really a special place. And when we look just back at this map again, all of the den sites that we kind of know about, all of them all over the place are really, really important points of interest on the property. Unlike lions, I mean, the Sausage Tree Republic, as David affectionately calls it, he's able to find them quite regularly there. But as soon as those cubs get a bit bigger, it's going to be very hard to keep up with them, very hard to find them. But when we've got a den site like we do with hyenas, what a place to go and watch and see the activity. Now, our next clip is looking at hyena dens and the socialization that goes on around them. And if spending time around a hyena den isn't your thing, well, then it's time for you to go make a coffee. But I know it's for everybody. So we go to just get ready here we've got the clip and we're going to push play and there we go so this is where the youngsters big and small interact with each other you can see the one on the right there is far smaller than the other one uh, but <laughs> there's a dominance involved there it's where social standing is met out is now going to catch a beating from two of them and that is the purpose of an ear and a foot is to be tugged at and pulled at as mum sits back there and does absolutely nothing this is the youngsters they need to sort it out for themselves there's lots of biting and lots of play that goes on all very important stages in hyena society as in with the lions all those fights and tackles that you see are very important in bringing in the skills that they need to eventually become a good hunter whereas the hyena all of these skills are designed for social standing and hierarchy that little nip at the ankle there possibly something to take down an impala but uh, all of this is to see where they stand in sort of the royal lineage of of hyenas and well haven't we spent so much time with the north clan and also with the juma den i mean some of you have been watching for years you've probably seen years and years worth of footage of hyenas at dens and i know for the most part of last year we had no den on the property and every single week almost every day people were asking steve have you found the hyena den yet and I kept going, no, we haven't. And now that we've got them back again, everyone is very excited. And hopefully we get to spend a bit more time with them. But we are noticing they are coming out a little bit later in the afternoon. And that's probably to do with maybe the, the temperatures we've been having. They do have at the new den their new social swimming pool really nearby, which is a very good sort of, um, sort of association for the hyenas, almost like the royal family going to their summer home and their winter home all over the UK when they are moving around as they go the royal lineage of the hyenas of juma while well, they are on their summer home now with their ensuite swimming pool which i think is fantastic and they often make me rather jealous but we are going to be spending time with them as much as we possibly can i believe trish is on her way there maybe she'll get them getting active and busy around the den because wouldn't that be the way for us to have a safari live episode with exactly the hyenas we're talking about because i hope they will pop out for you with Trisha a little bit later but while we wait to see if she has any luck there we're going to go all the way back up to the Masa Mara with David who is probably somewhere around the Mara River because he's got some hippos 
Well, let's come out of the tent and come out to the savannah because I decided to swim by the Mara River and look at ideally the water levels. I've not been here for quite some time and I thought, let me do something different and I let Isaac go check my friends, the sausages. And I have noticed the water levels have gone even lower than when I was here last. You can tell it's just trickling a little bit across there towards Serengeti or towards uh, Tanzania, unless you look very carefully, the water doesn't seem to be moving, but on a closer look, you can tell. I just kept quiet because of those hippos that were calling. I'm sure you had the hippos calling. <laughs> How lovely is that, eh? that I'll bet the water levels of the water being down, these hippos still can enjoy uh, calling and uh, either communicating of some sort, because we know hippos will always leave uh, the water early evenings to go out and graze the whole day. And definitely I'm trying to imagine there's some kind of arrangements that are being made. Paula, how are you today? And very good question, Paula. And you're asking where do the crocs go? Because I'll tell you one thing for a fact, Paula, that hippos will definitely have to need water to survive. Hippos, no water, no hippos. They're gone. They're gone, meaning that they die. Unless, of course, they look for any other area. I don't know what kind of other shelter they might look that will have to keep their skin very moist. But now crocs are very intelligent uh, reptiles. You know, people always see crocodiles by the water or by lakes and thinking, you know, these reptiles are not smart. They're very smart. The moment they realize the water levels are going low, they make themselves small little nest by the bank of the river. And they might remain there sometimes up to three months until the weather conditions improve. We know once they do that, we call that kind of uh, behavior ice activation. Once they do that, they slow the body processes, the breathing, the heartbeat, the digestion, everything slows down. And any food, any storage food they have on their body, that's what they survive in. They leave a very small hole in that nest through where they can breathe. And if you see a croc, like the Nile crocodiles that we have here in Kenya, some of them are 15, 18, 20 feet long. By the time they come out, you'll notice the tails have shrunk and they're only maybe nine or 10 feet you know, in length, meaning that any fat, anything, any fat deposit on the tails, that's what gets digested and that's what keeps them going until the rains come and then they're able to come out. So uh, this place, not one time, Paula, I've come here and missed to see a croc, but not one today. So what would happen? We are going to the long range, Paula, and if it's next month or so, once the long range come, you see all these rocks that you see here covered by water. And from where I am, I'm not very far from the North Clan of Hyenas. If Tim allows us to swing by there, but I'm sure Steve has a lot to tell us about hyenas. Well, Gigi, how incredible. You almost got the hippos mating. That would have been quite special. It's not something I've ever witnessed before. And looking at the level of the Mara River, wow, it's very, very low. Well, it seems like we've been having the rain and you have not. Well, very interesting. The Mara is a dynamic and diverse place. And with the flowing river, it is the lifeblood of that entire ecosystem. Has it ever gotten lower than that? I wonder. It seems as if those rocky areas there will facilitate quite easy movement for all those animals to cross so why they wait for the water to be high and busy with crocodiles why don't they just wait for it to drop a little bit and then just saunter across the rocks that seems the intelligent way to do it don't you think Sens? definitely you spend some time up there Sens actually is the one who recorded from the from the balloon that uh, the zebra that crossed the water and then came out and then the lions took it down on the other side. That was quite something to see, to be able to record that live because, well, the balloon is moving the whole time. 
I think you did a very good job, Sans. Very good job. So there was a question coming through there. I didn't get the name, though, but on what is the difference between hyena social organization and that of other species? Well, a cheetah are essentially a male or a female with their youngsters. Yes, there we go. This is coming through now. Child of the Universe, thank you very much. So a cheetah are a coalition of males or a female with their youngsters, um, and the male will come with a female, and they'll have a brief period, and then they'll split lines. It's a pride. You have a pride of females with their youngsters. The males come and go as they secure more prides. Wild dog, uh, they are an alpha pair, and they are the ones who breed, and they have male and females subordinates within that pack that don't breed, and they just assist in their rearing. Um, when you look at um, spotted hyena, obviously, they are matriarchy, uh, like elephants, except there's a di there's a, a hierarchy within the spotted hyenas. Elephants, there doesn't seem to be a hierarchy. Just the older you are, you know, the more sort of social standing you have, and they will come and go, and they'll move as they want to. But there's no real aggression shown, and the males are kind of kept away. Um, so there's 32 sort of matriarchal societies we talk about out here. But then when you look at the brown hyena, the brown hyena are not known to be a social animal at all, although you will sometimes find them in groups. They are essentially regarded as being solitary, as with most of the cats other than lions, are regarded as being solitary, same as leopards. It's the female with the offspring or the male coming in and out really just looking after territory that the females then move inside of and as we know you'll possibly get three females to the territory of one male and he will try and sire the offspring in all those females territories and then also secure that through his territorial markings as Tingana has been doing for the last few years but the hyenas they just have it very differently and how exactly it's come about by that is just a really interesting ecological sort of development or evolution development and it's surely worked they moved into that sort of niche as I said on the open plains, there's a, an abundance of food left after in carcasses that hyenas with their very strong jaw and that sagittal crest on the top allowing for the muscles to attach allow them to really access the bones and the cartilage and all those things that all the other animals can't. So the hyenas and the mara are able to feed throughout the year without necessarily hunting as they can scavenge off carcasses that are left behind. Vicky, for their body size, hyenas have got the strongest bite in the animal kingdom. Uh, they reckon a crocodile's probably got a stronger bite force, but for its size, crocodiles are far bigger than hyena. Out of the predators, there's no predator that has quite got the same sort of form. Let me show you exactly what we're talking about over here. On the head of the hyena has got this, the sagittal crest, and that is for muscle attachment over there. So the, the muscles actually come down in that. If you hold your, your, your cheek on the side of your face over here and you do that, feel how the muscles attached here. It's only attached here somewhere to the side of our, of our jaw, really. It's only sort of attached there. Whereas in hyena, it comes all the way up onto this top ridge here. Those muscles are attached there. And so when it, it's got that enormous force down and these bones, these teeth on the side here are designed for cracking and breaking open all sorts of bones. An extremely powerful bite with those extremely powerful teeth. I mean, if we show you the leopard over here, the leopard has also got a similar sort of sagittal crest, but it's nowhere near as pronounced, so the muscle attachment is much less on there. They've also got quite a powerful bite, but they're not designed for breaking bone. They still have the same type of teeth on the side, the carnassial shear, but they're not really designed for breaking as big a bones as hyenas do. They fit into, into they fit into that niche for that. Probably the most powerful teeth for the animal of their size because they're not going to be replaced. Uh, crocodiles, although they have got beautiful, beautiful powerful strong teeth their teeth are erupting underneath each other all the time so while one tooth is there there's another one coming up underneath so a crocodile can lose that tooth they'll just be replaced underneath hyena like us are going to be stuck with it for life so they need to be careful they are powerfully strong they don't have the luxury of a dentist can you imagine that getting a hyena dentist out here the smells i think would be quite something Okay, well, it seems like Shishal has managed to find something that is not Impala or Wildebeest. It seems to be rather big. Should we go and have a look exactly what it is? Yes, I have. We've finally found some heartbeats in the bush. Now, <laughs> this is actually just the straggler left behind here at the moment. But we had about six of them 
walk right past the vehicle. Two youngsters come say hello to me right by the bonnet. They have a lot of bravado, these youngsters, and they come right up to you and they're like waving their, their ears around. Very cool. But mom was so calm. She walked right by. She looked at me. She ate a little bit and she said, oh, I know you. You can see them through the bushes just a little bit. Now there's a little water, sort of a little watering hole next to us here. And it literally is a hole filled with water. You won't be able to see it. But, uh, she, oh, and there she is. She's drank a lot of water. So maybe it's all finally coming out. Very, very quick turnaround time. <laughs> no, definitely not. That's definitely not the water she just drank. That is from the day. They are quite... Yeah, let's listen for a moment. You'll hear them walking around. I bet you can hear the wind and that Cape Turtle Dove in the background. It really is a beautiful day. The sun is so soft. So we actually ran into these Ellie's on our way to the hyena den. We thought it'd be a great way to wrap up by kind of stopping over at the hyena den. So I am going to make my way down there a little bit. So let's drive. It's always a nice experience to be surrounded by Ellie's. Kimberly says, such calm Ellie's, aren't they just? You always, with elephants, it's always, um, I mean, how you behave or how you feel comes across quite a bit. And these elephants, we kind of took the corner and then they were all there. And to be honest, when that happens, usually the elephants get a bit spooked and it's not the most uh, comfortable sighting. But these guys were so calm. They looked at us a couple times. They picked up the trunk. They gave a bit of a sniff around. And all calm and relaxed. Always beautiful. And we're almost at the hyena den. Hopefully these cubs will be out. In the meantime, let's go to the kinky sausages. Is that what I heard, Faith? Yes, uh, welcome back, and we're still here with um, this Miles. They doing what they do best after having a good meal. Uh, resting, 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 tossing and turning, uh, digesting what they had eaten. Yeah, there is nothing much happening. They're just moving around. Yon, yon, yon. This one here is your yeah. beautiful. Is it gonna yawn again? Yeah, yeah, maybe yes. Yawn, 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 Nice, look at that. Wow, super. Perfect canines. Those are the, well, those are very useful teeth of a lion. If they break, it might starve to death. Those are the ones that he uses to punch up, break into the skin and bite into the windpipe or a jungle vein, trachea and make a kill. So if he uses those, it is doomed. It's cleaning itself very much like a kitty cat, but much larger cousin. Beautiful, look at that. you don't want to be licked by that tongue it is very rough it is like sandpaper number 16 if it was to lick you it will peel your skin off you know your meat yeah. so it's very very rough just imagine a domestic cut tongue multiplied by 10 that's how rough it is so you don't want to get licked Finak 
thank you for your question. You ask us uh, where are the males. Uh, this pride is dominated by two males. We call them the Oldonio Pike males. It, it is a coalition of two males that hang around together and they have a very big territory. They dominate more than three prides and I think one pride is actually in Tanzania. So they move around these prides so we only see them very few times. It's a rather a very unique you know, setup that they have but it does happen in the cat world and especially in the lion world. So they are somewhere and they are in another of their territory. Yeah. The yawning, yawning, yawning is sometimes getting restless and so she might end up standing up sooner or later, this female here. So the, although the last time I saw one of the males was about four days ago and she was one she was with one of these females but since then she has he has disappeared and I haven't seen him since but i know they will appear every couple of weeks they'll appear and then come be with the females familiarize with what's happening and then move on again maybe to the other pride we don't know what other prides they dominate we'll soon have to learn but definitely they do have other hides because they don't stick around for very long. This is um, a pride that is growing very fast. If all these cubs survive, you know, with the numbers, they're 10, together with the females, already there will be 15. So in the next two years, if they start giving birth again, this pride might grow to over 20. So it's something, something to look forward to and hope that it will get that big and see what happens. It is a rather a unique um, pride because unlike other prides that you know, hunt for small game, these females are masters of killing big game and that's why they're doing very well. And I think there'll be some of the big prides we have in the Masai Mara. Of course, they're very small, but very very uh, successful i've never seen you know five females you know stick together like this and be healthy like they are this time of the year this time of the year you normally come across you know five females they would be very very skinny because it is tough times you know most of the game doesn't like this tall grass Yes, you know, this time, you know, they get quite um, skinny because it is tough for animals to move out of long grass because they don't want to be hunted. So lions become very skinny at this time of the year. Um, let me, um, you know, take you to my colleague Trishala, who's got some hyena, while I wait for these guys to get active. I have just reached the den. In fact, let me show you the entrance, so I'll go a little bit forward. There we go. At the den, the resort that the Juma clan now stays at. So you watch the long history of how they've come from all parts of the, of the reserve, even down to Little Gauri, and now they're back up here. I think it's their best den site, to be honest. Now, it is quiet. Nobody's home at the moment, but the cubs are definitely in there. That's what they'll do. They'll spend time inside the den when mum is gone away, especially during the day. And then mum will come back very soon and they'll have a suckling session and off again. Now, we were speaking about stresses that the hyenas can face. And if you look around, BK, can you get that hole there? Now, if you all remember, the me falling into the the bit on the road the other day when we actually went back and had a look we saw that it had been dug up by an elephant and that's actually around the erosion that had the, the walls had collapsed around so what you're seeing there is actually a similar thing it looks as though an elephant or something like that has dug it up and that kind of gives you an idea I've seen a lot of these holes around as we've been driving.
from them, but it gives you an idea that these animals are interacting with other animals constantly, and that brings about stress. And that's why they have these dens. They have the, to safely keep cubs away. Um, even though cubs are fairly precocial or fairly well developed when they're born, they're still small and vulnerable and they need to be protected. Hence, the den site. Interestingly, submissive uh, males mostly, but also submissive, uh, suppose, members of the clan in general, uh, a, uh, actually undergo so much stress just from the fact that they have less availability of food and that sort of thing. <laughs> Alexandria, a really, really interesting question, and I'm going to get back to the stress in a moment, but let me just answer this question first. Alexandria asked if Hyenas dig their own holes or they use burrows or pre-dug holes by some other animals. In a desperate times, if there is nothing else available, they will dig holes. Uh, but they will generally use an already excavated burrow. And what they will do is they will excavate it further. So if you can see there on BK's shot right there, it looks like this fresh, darker soil at the back where those roots are coming out. And that would have been areas where the hyenas themselves would have dug to widen that entrance. And also think of it as, would you, have, would you rather put in the effort to redo something that could be used by, that has been created in, by another animal and used by yourself. It takes a lot of energy, a lot of time, and a lot of effort from the hyena to have to dig its own burrow or den site. So it's, it's just much easier and it makes more sense for them to use one that's already been dug out. It really does. Especially one like this where it's unused. And I'm sure Steve has told you all about the insides of it and how they excuse me, when it rains, what they have on the inside, they have sort of little ri rising bits in the inside so that even if it does flood, they have kind of little bits, islands on the inside that they can stand up onto. Now we were speaking about stress and interestingly, the stress that a lot of submissive hyenas undergo can actually cause genetic changes in their actual chromosomes. and uh, tests were conducted and found that submissive hyenas had substantially shorter telomeres on their chromosomes. Telomeres are the ends of the chromosomes that are usually responsible for aging, amongst other things. Uh, and what that actually means for the submissive hyena, apparently it means lower uh, androstenedione or androgens in general. So that can account for, if it's correct, remember this is all apparently, uh, if that's correct, then that kind of accounts for how some hyenas behave submissively and are born into the submissiveness and keep it that way and why other hyenas sort of, apart from inheriting the, their mother's rank socially, perhaps they actually inherit their mother's rank biologically as well, which I think is really, really interesting. Very cool. Well, we're not going to stay here much longer because these cubs are super curious and we don't want to entice them out with no adults around. So I'm going to leave here. In the meantime, let's go over to Steve. The Hyena Resort. I love that, Trish. It is such a resort, isn't it? With the um, the little plunge pool there. That all they need is some cocktail waiters to bring them some some apple juice in the hot sun. And there's one of those afternoons, maybe they have decided to go and find Pretty, but uh, some people have been agreeing that uh, indeed one of Pretty's cubs were indeed seen at the den last night. So thank you for confirming that. It's, where are they denning though? It's very interesting. And it's one of those things that's important with hyenas is that they will have communal dens. And the purpose of having a communal den is that all the individuals in the, the clan can smell, see, and, and 
sort of know who that animal is. If a female, for example, June, had gone off and she'd had a den on her own, uh, away from the rest of the clan, those youngsters might not have been accepted when it came time for socialization. So young hyenas are very interested in younger hyenas, and they will play with them, they will chase them around, they will play with that social order, because it's all about social order, as we said. So sort of those communal dens are so important for the sort of livelihood of the den itself, from the clan, should I say. And if they go off on their own, coming back they might not be received as well so i'm sure as trish says those youngsters are hiding underground they are waiting who knows where mum is corky and um, june are both off who knows where maybe they're off on a kill that we don't know about in the south maybe they've followed the unkuhumas somewhere because as we know when we spend a lot of time with hyena out here they are always on the move being a hyena in real life it's not just about the den it's not just about the youngsters they have competition with so many other animals that are constantly in and about and uh, while being a hyena high ranking low ranking is not an easy affair in the Masai Mara and they don't they do quite well in their numbers down here in Juma we don't have the same sort of numbers but they have got lots and lots of competitors uh, we know them down here as quite a sort of lowly scavengers but I'm sure they do hunt in their own right we just don't really see it but one more clip to do to finish off the show is um, how exactly the hyenas interact with other animals in and around and so we're going to start on the computer over here it's going to start with some wild dogs and as we know with wild dogs the wild dogs on their own one-on-one -on -one, will be taken out by a hyena but they are able to come together in a unified rank and together as a unit a hyena doesn't stand a chance against those biting teeth Obviously, the bite force of a single hyena is incredibly powerful. The dogs don't really want to go in it on its own. But as a group, they will very, very readily chase a hyena off, uh, off of its own kill. Obviously, the hyenas will do the same. And then what can we say about the little chief, Hosanna? He often caught meals too big for himself, and he wasn't always able to get them up the tree. And while the hyenas in Juma probably have survived the last year because of him and his antics of catching prey too big for himself, and here we've got, a, I'm not sure who that is. Uh, the tail is erect. Was he taking the nyala that Hosanna so nicely had? There is an entire different scene of another hyena coming in and stealing another kill from Hosanna. So it's not a once-off affair. He has constantly been under pressure from the hyenas out here and slowly over time developing his own sort of reputation. Tingana doesn't seem to lose any food to hyenas. Hukumuri we don't really know. We don't spend too much time. But you'll notice this with male leopards. After a period of time, hyenas start leaving them alone. Uh, in the beginning... They just take them out. They know through a smell. Like, like a hyena would know who Senzo is, who I am very easily through smell. So they know who Tlalamba is. They know who, who Kumuri is. They know who Tandi is. And they know who they can compete with and who they can't. And I remember seeing leopards in, in the Singita property in the Kruger who would sit on the ground with a kill. And the hyenas just knew, no, no, I don't want to fight this male leopard. But a female leopard or a male that they know that's small and not so dominant, they'll quickly run in. Sort of that element of dominance and of surprise. They come in confidently and leopards generally will move away but some leopards have earned their spots and their stripes indeed and uh, well leopards and hyena here in juma the dynamic continues and well we are going to be spending time with the juma clan and all of our various sort of um what we should say the dynasty of the leopards here over the next few years and it has been wonderful being able to share all these hyenas with you i know it's gone down a bit of a memory lane with some of you but well there's no cuter way to sort of get towards the end of the show isaac has lucked out this afternoon he's taken the spoils from Gigi, and he is still with the gorgeous and cute Sausage Tree Pride. You're alive now? Well, these guys are very busy, 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 trying to get in as much as possible. It is quite chilly, so something warm, I'm sure, it is more than welcome. Those are two different, you know, ages of cubs. There's the older ones, uh, that is uh, the, youngest, the younger ones. And then there's the bigger one behind. And they're all trying to get in to get the fair share of milk. Yeah, the older one came in and he tried to take over all the tits. These guys have you know, had a, quite a drink. You can tell that one is quite a large one, almost six months. But he's still very dependent on his mommy's milk. Actually, this is not mommy, it's actually, I would say, auntie. 
um, uh, the little guy, you know, at the front, you know, is going like to say thank you, thank you, you know, to mommy. Look at that. It's really cute. Yeah. It's like thank you for milk. Yeah. They're really cute when they're young. Mm. Carla, you say, so sweet getting milk buffet. <laughs> yes, it is. It's a good time to get actually some, some milk. Uh, so thank you for your comment. Yeah, remember this is happening right here in the Mara. And it's all lots and lots of fun. I'm really having fun. I hope you know you're doing the same. Yes, these guys, you know, they're getting used to us at the same time. Yeah, cleaning mom. Yeah, it's really cute, this one. This is the one that survived, you know, five nights without food. Really incredible, hard to believe. But, you know, he, he you know, she did it. She's actually one of my favorites. Now look at that. Yes, um, well, it's been a beautiful afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining me, from me and my colleagues, Steve, Trish, Shala, David, me, and my cameraman, Jay Andre. It's Isaac here. Goodbye, and see you tomorrow.